Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can again gather together and worship you and to study your word. And we just pray, Lord, as we begin First John this evening, that you teach us those lessons we need to learn. Father, as we look at uh, all that John has to say about who Jesus is, and uh, Lord, his testimony is sure because he saw Jesus, he was with, with, Je- with Jesus, he heard Jesus, and what a powerful testimony this is. Father, again, we thank you. We pray for our worship that it would honor you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This evening, if you would, please turn in your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1 as we're continuing our study through the Bible. And we begin this really fascinating letter. I'm exciting to get it, excited to be in 1 John. Um, keep in mind, though, that towards the end of John's life, Emperor Domitian sentenced John to be boiled in oil for his faith for proclaiming that Jesus is Lord and Savior. And that's what tradition tells us. It's not what the scriptures tell us. But the boiling had no effect on John. He survived. And so Domitian ordered John to be sent to the island of Patmos off the coast of Asia Minor. And this was nothing more than a barren rock that juts out of the Aegean Sea. And it served as a Roman penal colony where prisoners basically went there to die. And it's there on this barren island that God gave John the book of Revelation. In fact, in Revelation 1.9, we're told of that. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, Domitian died in 96 AD. John was released and allowed to return to Ephesus where He lived out the remainder of his life in ministry, and John was buried in Ephesus. And many believe that 1 John, 2 John, 3 John were written sometime between 80 AD, 95 AD, probably a little earlier in the 90s than 95. And so it seemed, obviously, that these were written before his imprisonment on Patmos. And now, after he's released, John is around 100 years old. Probably the, he's the last surviving apostle. The others were martyred for their faith in Jesus, but John wasn't. And again, I understand, you know, John doesn't mention himself specifically that he wrote this letter or this epistle. Um, but it was obviously someone who was close to Jesus, who walked with him and saw the risen Lord. And from external evidence, we see the early church fathers like Polycarp, who knew John, Irenaeus, Clement of Alexandria, and Tertullian all speak of the Apostle John being the author of this letter. And John doesn't say who this letter is to, which church or churches he's writing to, but again, it seems to be that John was writing to the churches in Asia Minor. The churches mentioned in Revelation chapters 2 and 3, like I said, Ephesus was part of that. And I think, again, he wrote this probably from Ephesus. That's where tradition tells us John was at. One of the problems that John was dealing with, keep in mind the early church was being attacked with false teachers, but for John, one of the big things was Gnosticism, or those who knew. Uh, The Greek gnosis means knowledge, and this group supposedly had some kind of special, special spiritual insight that went way beyond the word of God. And understand that there were various views within Gnosticism, but one of our ideas was that the flesh is evil and the spirit's good. Thus, a divine being could never inhabit a body of flesh. And here's a main point in this false teaching, and it's in regard to Jesus. Some said that he was just a spirit, that he hovered over the ground. When Jesus walked, he didn't leave footprints because he was spirit. Others said that when Jesus was baptized, the Spirit of God came upon him and left before he went to the cross. So John is dealing with some of these difficult issues because this was beginning to enter into the church, and it was only going to spread more and more. And so he wanted to, like Barney Five would say, nip it in the bud, right? That's what he wanted to do before it got out of control. Now, there are four main reasons, and if I thought about it last time I would have given you as an assignment. What are the four reasons John wrote this epistle or this letter? And I'll tell them to you. The first one is that your joy may be full, and we see that in 1 John 1, 4. These things we write to you that your joy may be full. John wants 
these believers to be overflowing with the joy of the Lord. And so that's one of the outcomes of reading this letter is to be encouraged like that. The second thing is that you may not sin. And we see that in 1 John 2, 1, where John said, My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So again, the idea here is growing in holiness, to walk in the truth as any father desires of his children. And John was kind of the spiritual father to them, and he wanted them to mature, to grow. The third reason is that you may not be deceived. 1 John 2.26, these things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Again, how do you combat deception? By knowing the truth. When you know the truth, it dispels or destroys the lies that are being spoken. And that's important. It's a warning to beware of false teachers. And the fourth reason is that you may believe. And we see that in 1 John 5.13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So not only really to believe uh, in Jesus, to receive that free gift of eternal life that's only found in him, but to know that our salvation is secure in Jesus and we can know that we're saved. That's huge. You know, some people say, well, I'll wait till we get to heaven and we'll see what happens. That's too late. You can deal with it now. And it's interesting how this plays out. John's writing these things so your joy may be full and it's focused or it's accomplished as we focus on Jesus. He's writing these things so that you may not sin and that's accomplished as we are led by the Spirit striving against sin. He's writing these things so you may not be deceived by the false teachers with their doctrines of demons, and it's accomplished as the Word of God is opened up and we apply it to our lives. And John wrote these things so that you may believe, so you'll not only come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but you would know that your salvation is secure in Him, and really that's the heart of the Father. So Jesus brings us this joy. The Spirit keeps us from sinning. The Word keeps us from the lies of the devil. And we're secure in Christ. It's the heart of the Father. So as we go through this letter, we're going to pick up on these things because that's what John is trying to instill in these believers who maybe have been complacent now. Well, you think, well, how could they be complacent? What change that they were with their walk with the Lord wasn't where it should have been? Well, let's think about this. It's been maybe 60 years since the Lord was crucified. We're into the second and third generations of Christians. And what was important to that first generation maybe wasn't passed down to future generations. And John, a first generation Christian, an elder, wants to stir them up, kind of like Paul always wanted to do. He wanted to wake them and keep them from the airs that were creeping into the church. And I have a very simple outline of this letter. In chapters 1 and 2 of 1 John, it's the light of God. Chapters 3 and 4, the love of God. And chapter 5, the life of God. And I like how the Life Application Bible puts, kind of sums up these, this letter. They write, John wrote about the most vital aspects of faith so readers would know Christian truth from error. He emphasizes the basics of faith so we can be confident in our faith. In our dark world, God is light. In our cold world, God brings the warmth of love. In our dying world, God brings life. When we feel a lack of confidence, these truths bring us certainty. Absolutely. So let's pick up 1 John chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Let's see what the Lord has for us this evening as we study his word. John wrote this, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. So here's a, John's opening up with a big bang, man. He's laying it all out. He, as he speaks of Jesus, he tells us that which was from the beginning. And he's not talking about the beginning of the world or the beginning of creation, but before there was anything, when all there existed was God, Jesus was there. The word was there. In fact, remember Micah 5 2, verses we tend to focus on at Christmas time. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you were are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are from old, from everlasting. 
In other words, that phrase from everlasting means from beyond the vanishing point. As far back in, as you can go, God the Son has always existed. We see the same thing in uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. And we'll be in the Gospel of John on Sunday mornings doing an in-depth study on John, I think in the first week in May sometime. But listen to what John said. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. In other words, the Word, which became Jesus in the incarnation, has always existed. He's equal with the Father, and he's eternal. Also, remember what Genesis 1.1 says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Those words are connected to the creation of the physical universe. Genesis starts out with the physical creation. It moves us forward in time. John is, again, speaking of something different there in John chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, and really here in 1 John. John's gospel takes us back before time in the physical universe existed to teach the pre-existence of Christ to the creation. In fact, when John says, in the beginning was the word, he uses it in the imperfect form of the Greek word, an, which expresses the idea of continuous, timeless existence. What does that mean? It means he's eternal. It's pretty simple. And then in John 1, 3, when he says all things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made, he uses the Greek word eneto, which means to come into existence, begin to be. And he's speaking of the creation of all things, the physical universe and all that goes with it. Two different words. But in regard to the word, in regard to Jesus, no matter how far back you go in time, the word has always existed because Jesus is God. I think that's an important way to start out this letter or this epistle. And how did God come into existence? The Bible never tells us. He just tells us he's always existed, he's eternal. With my finite mind, I don't understand that. I don't understand how something could be eternal. But, you know, like I've told you before, I got 18 on my ACT score, so, you know, don't expect a whole lot from me. I know what the Bible says. The Bible says that God is eternal. He's always existed, and I believe that by faith. I mean, really, how do you explain the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit? We can try to figure it out using some man-made ideas, but the reality is I don't get it with my finite mind, but I trust it because that's what God has said. And the eternal God, Jesus, became flesh, dwelt among us. And what's interesting is John can attest to that with 100% confidence. Like, well, how could he be so sure? Because John was there. He heard Jesus talk. He saw Jesus with his own eyes. He looked steadfastly at Jesus, examining him. And he touched Jesus. So Jesus is not some kind of ghost or spirit. He was flesh and blood in the incarnation, and he's fully God. Now, in spite of what the Gnostics were saying, John was there. These things are true concerning the word of life. The Gnostics weren't there. They didn't see this. And so they're wrong. As one writer put it, I'm so glad my knowledge of eternal life is not built upon the speculations of the philosophers or even theologians, but on the impeccable testimony of those who heard, saw, gazed at, and handled him in whom it was incarnate. It is not merely a lovely dream, but solid fact, carefully observed and an accurately recorded fact. Now, again, some people say, well, how do we know it's true? Well, how do you know any historical event is true if you weren't there? Because we have people who were there that wrote about these events. Well, that's exactly what John is doing here. He was an eyewitness of these things, so he's writing with 100% accuracy, also inspired by the Holy Spirit. You know, the other thing that's wonderful here is people are looking for abundant life. We have it in Jesus. You know, apart from Jesus, you'll never find it. You know, Paul said in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So apart from Christ, there's death, 
But in Christ, guess what? There's life, abundant life. I like Warren Worsby summing this, how he sums this up. He said, if you were God, how would you go about revealing yourself to men? How could you tell them about and give them the kind of life you wanted them to enjoy? God has revealed himself in creation, but creation alone could never tell us the story of God's love. God has also revealed himself much more fully in his word, the Bible. But God's final and most complete revelation is in his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Because Jesus is God's revelation of himself, he has a very special name, the Word of Life. The same title opens John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Why does Jesus Christ have this name? Because Christ is to us what our words are to others. Our words reveal to others just what we think and how we feel. Christ reveals to us the mind and heart of God. He is the living means of communication between God and men. To know Jesus Christ is to know God. Exactly. And and listen to what John goes on to say regarding his witness of Jesus. Look at verses 2 and 3 here in 1 John chapter 1. He says, The life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Now again, the Gnostics believe that if the flesh is evil and Jesus is flesh, then he can't be God. But John already showed them that Jesus is eternal, that he is God. But the majority of the Gnostics believe that Jesus is God. They did believe that. But he couldn't be flesh, and that heresy was being brought into the church. It was a doctrine against his humanity. Robertson put it like this. He said, The Gnostic speculation concerned itself primary, primarily with the origin of the universe and the existence of evil. They assumed that God is good, and yet there is evil in existence. Their theory was that evil is inherent in matter, and yet the good God could not create evil matter. So they postulated a series of emanations, eons, spirits, angels, that came in between God and matter. The idea was that one eon came from God, another eon from this eon, and so on, until there was one far enough away from God for God not to be contaminated by the creation of evil, matter, and yet close enough to have the power to do the work. That's kind of the heresy that the Jehovah Witnesses hold on to. Jesus is not Almighty God but a lesser God, but that's not true. In fact, God said, I'll have no other gods before me, so that can't be true. In fact, Jesus over and over in the Gospel of John claimed to be God. That was one of the things that the Jewish religious leaders had against him. When uh, they said to Jesus, you know, um, or Jesus asked them, why are you stoning me? He said, we're not stoning you uh, for what you did, we're stoning you for stoning you because you, being a man, claim to be equal with God. And the way it's written in the Greek is this is continually what Jesus was doing, telling the people that he is God. And it blew the mind of the Jewish religious leaders. They couldn't take it. They didn't believe it. And that's why with this whole Gnosticism thing, if Jesus is fully God, and he is, but according to their reasoning, He couldn't become flesh because then he would be evil. But that's not what the scriptures teach. And when we get into the Gospel of John, we'll see that all laid out for us. And throughout the scriptures, it speaks of the Messiah without sin. But think about it. If the physical body was evil, then it would have to be punished with what? Well, starving yourself, punishing yourself, denying basic hygiene and the likes. You're punishing yourself. A lot of religions do that, right? The other line of reasoning went like this. Look, since only the spirit of man is important, the physical can be indulged with sex, food, and other excesses because it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter what you do to it, so indulge it with every form of debauchery because only the spirit of man matters. What do you think was the most popular view? Might as well indulge the flesh, right? Because it doesn't matter. That's what they're going after. And they went around with their false doctrine and telling Christians that, look, do whatever you want. It's okay. Wrong. 
again, did Jesus only come in spirit? Or did he become flesh and blood in the incarnation? 100% God, 100% man. 1 John 4, verses 2 and 3. John said, by this you know the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. You see, when you understand who John is writing to, you understand why he's saying that. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. But if you don't, if you're believing what the Gnostics are saying, then you're not of God. And you know how they got people, I guess, to join with them? They say, oh, you don't understand it? Well, it really takes a special person to understand because it's really deep. It's kind of like Reformed theology, uh, even the Hebrew Roots movement. You know, you got, oh, you, it, it's so deep, you just don't get it. And yet, the Bible is for every person on this planet. And it's written in such a way that everyone can understand it. And you could spend a lifetime trying to dig out all the golden nuggets in there and you will never do it. That's how amazing the Bible is. And this is what John's coming against, this false teaching. In fact, even in 2 John 1, 7, he says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. So yeah, they infiltrated the early church already with false teaching some 60 years down the road. And you look at a lot of the letters that are written, these epistles, and they're dealing with false doctrine, false teachers. Because they'll use the opportunity to deceive the people. How could people fall prey to them? Well, first of all, they're deceivers, right? So they're very good at what they do. They deceive you. And a lot of times people don't know what the word of God has to say. They don't understand what the scriptures are saying. So they hear these people and go, well, that, that sounds right. It sounds legitimate. And it's not. In fact, in the Gospel of John, John 1, 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So it's not that the scriptures don't say that Jesus became, God became flesh and dwelt among us. So either people don't know what the word of God says, or they ignore what the word of God says and they believe what a man is saying. So we got to be careful. In fact, in 1 John 1, 2, the word manifested in the Greek means to cause to become visible, to make appear, to cause to be seen. Yeah, he was manifested before us. He's the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15. So if you want to know what God the Father is all about, you want to know what he's like, you look at Jesus. Because he's a picture of what the Father looks like. And, you know, the problem for us is sin has separated us from God. And the Father had that eternal life to give us, that everlasting life, but sin kept him from doing that. Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. So a price had to be paid for our sins. And how was that done? God became flesh. He tabernacled or dwelt among us. He went to the cross of Calvary and paid in full the penalty for our sins. And because of that, we can have fellowship with the Father because our mediator, our bridge builder, Jesus Christ has done that for us. And that's what Peter tells us. 1 Peter 3.18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust. Why? That he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And, you know, John here in in 1 John 1, he's talking about fellowship. Fellowship with God, fellowship with each other. Koinonia is the Greek word. 
And Jesus came so we could restore that fellowship with God. The fellowship, think about the fellowship that Adam had in the garden where God walked with Adam in the Garden of Eden. Now, through Jesus Christ, our fellowship with God is restored. How important that is. And because of what Christ has done, we can have fellowship with each other because he's brought us together. I mean, think about it. I mean, look around the room. Chances are most of us wouldn't be together apart from Christ, right? Right? But Christ has joined us together. He's broken down the middle wall of division. He's brought us into the body of believers. Wow. In fact, think about the night before Jesus was crucified, all that was going through his mind, all that he was thinking about. And he's praying to the Father in John chapter 17. And in verses 20 to 23, look at what was on his heart as he was preparing to go to the cross. He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. You know, in knowing all this and receiving all this into our lives, what does that do for us? And here's the kicker for me. And it's the first reason John wrote this. Look at verse 4 in 1 John 1. And these things we write to you, why? I'm adding the why. <laughs> that your joy may be full. Pretty simple. A result of fellowship with God, fellowship with believers, all that God has for us, our joy is going to be full. David, Psalm 1611, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And what John is doing here is really echoing very clearly the idea that Jesus brought before his disciples the night before his crucifixion. And he wanted them, he wanted fullness of joy for them, even though the cross was directly in front of them. In fact, in John 15, 11, Jesus said this, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. John 16, 24, Until now you have asked nothing in my name, ask and you will receive, that your joy may be full. John 17, 13, but now I come to you and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What does God want for our lives? He wants us to be full of joy, joy that is based in him, that fullness. Now, we tend to base our joy on outward circumstances and that doesn't work, does it? Because those constantly change. I like what one writer said. He said, how much Christians need to learn this? There is so much bickering in Christian circles, so much complaining, so much unhappiness. This was never meant to be. Christians were meant to be filled with love and joy and peace. In short, with all the virtues that are the result of the life of Christ within the Christian. To be filled with Christ is the secret of real Christian living. It is the secret of true happiness. And yet, how many times do we lose our joy? And John says, I want your joy to be full. Don't lose it. Why do we lose it? Well, because of, again, external circumstances, sin, moods, emotions. It could take that joy away. And Christian joy is based upon Jesus, others, and yourself. Joy. And if we take our eyes off of Jesus and we focus on the external circumstances, it's overwhelming. And we've all done it. I mean, believe me, I go through these things too. But they can take control of our life. And we can lose that joy. But guys, one day we're going to be with Jesus for eternity. There is nothing greater than that. And right now, yeah, things sometimes get a little tough. Yeah, there are people get sick, people die. There's all kinds of things that go on. 
But God's in control, and I don't understand it always. I don't understand the good that's going to come out of it, but I know good comes out of these things because that's what God said. So that's where I have to just rest in him. Even though I don't understand it, I don't see it, but I have to believe it by faith. Or I will lose that joy. In fact, John 15, 11, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. I think that's interesting. That my joy may remain in you. What does that mean? It means we're focused on Jesus, right? And when we have the Lord's joy in us, our joy is full. Awesome, isn't that? I mean, think about that. We're focused upon Jesus, and our joy is going to be full. Who are you focused on? It's an important question. Verse 5 here in 1 John 1. This is the message which we have heard from him and declare to you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And this just kind of goes along with what we've been talking about here. But keep in mind, John is not making this up. It's not his own personal opinion. It's not what he thinks about God, but it's God's message that he spoke to John about himself. The me- this is the message which we have heard from him. From who? From Jesus. And now we're declaring it to you. So John has the authority. He was with Jesus. He heard Jesus. And now he's declaring to us these things. And what's the message that God gave to John? Well, one of them is, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I like that. God is absolutely holy. He's absolutely righteous. He's absolutely pure. And if we don't understand that about God, that in him there is a complete absence of evil of any kind, we're going to be doubting some of the things that we're seeing with our physical eyes, some of the things we're going through. Because, you know, when you hear sometimes people talk about God, about God, they have a lot of ideas about him. But a lot of them are their ideas, their opinions, their views about God, and they're worthless. John says, look, I've heard these things, and I'm sharing these things with you. It's not my opinion. And here's the thing. Again, this is an important point. When bad things happen, when life gets tough, are you going to blame God? You may feel that way. You know, oh, God doesn't love me. How can God do that to me? God is not being fair, and the list goes on. Now, remember in our study in Ruth that we are doing on Sunday mornings, Naomi, her name means pleasant. She went out of the house of bread, Bethlehem, to uh, Moab, the wash pot. Ten years she spent there. She comes back, and as she comes back to Bethlehem, some of the women recognize her. Is that you, Naomi? She's gone ten years. She says, don't call me pleasant anymore. Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. Call me bitter. Why was she bitter? She's bitter at God. God, you did this. It's like I got a bullseye on my back. You're hitting me with your arrows all the time. My husband died in Moab. My two sons died. I was left with my two daughter-in-laws who are Moabites. My kids shouldn't have married them. And now one of them stayed back in Moab, but one followed me even after I asked her not to. And it took a while as God was working in the life of Naomi for Naomi to see the hand of God upon her life once again. That God was going to use these things for good. And it it transformed her. She was once again Naomi and not Mara or Bitter. And I think that's important for us. You see, God is light. There is no darkness in him at all. So it's not a problem that God has. It's our perception of God. And isn't perspective everything? I mean, I've used this before, but think about it. Okay, it's, you know, January, and it's 50 degrees outside. And what are we doing? We're walking outside, no jackets on. We're going, this is awesome. 50 degrees, right? Now, it's July, and it's 50 degrees outside. And what are you saying? It's freezing out here. You got a jacket on. You probably got a hat on. 
I can't believe it's so cold. It's the same temperature. Well, now your perspective is different. In the wintertime, 50 is awesome. But in the summertime, it's horrible. We can't lose our perspective of God. In him is no darkness at all. He is light, period, exclamation point. And what does light do? Well, light exposes things. It's pure. It speaks of holiness. It guides people, helps us to see, see while darkness speaks of sin. It speaks of evil. It speaks of being lost, not able to see where you're going. And God is light. That's what James said. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. You know, I don't have to worry about God because he's always the same. He's unchanging. You know, the sun has sunspots, dark spots in it, right? God doesn't. He's pure light. There's no darkness in him at all, not even a, a, a little sliver of darkness. He's light. And we need to have that concept of God. And if we don't, it's going to mess us up. John's going to give to us two points about how, about how this affects our lives, understanding God is light and there's no darkness in him at all. The first point is in 1 John 1, 6. Listen to what John said. He said, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. In other words, you can't say that you're walking with God if you're living in sin. And the Greek word for walk is conveying a habitual lifestyle. We all blow it. We all sin. That's not what John is talking about. And the idea is, how can you be walking in fellowship with God when you're moving in the opposite direction from him? And you can't. You're continuing on in sin. You're ignoring the conviction of God in your life like David did. Remember when David sinned with Bathsheba, had her husband Uriah, one of his mighty men, killed in battle. And it took David almost a whole year before he repented and got right with God. And there were consequences to his actions. So, yeah, we need to not walk in that way of life. We need to walk with God because he is light. Now, the big question probably for some is, is John speaking of salvation here that we can lose it? I don't think so. I think he's speaking about fellowship with the Father because that's what he's been talking about. He's talking about our koinonia, our fellowship with God. And our sin can break that fellowship with him. And this is not an occasional slip. It's a lifestyle. It's a pattern of walking in darkness of unrepentant sin. I knew a person who... You know, the guy said he was a Christian, but was continually involved with pornography, continually. No matter who talked with him, he refused to change. Is he a believer? I seriously doubt it. Could he be? I guess he could be, but I doubt it because he has no conviction of God. He doesn't see anything wrong in what he's doing, and that's a red flag to me. So John is not talking about that. He's talking about fellowship, breaking this fellowship. Paul, 1 Corinthians 5, verses 9 through 13. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexually immoral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or extortioners or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or an idolater or a reveler or a drunkard or an extortioner, not even to eat with such a person. For what have I to do with judging those who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. So John, or Paul's not saying, you know, stay away from... Uh, the unsaved world, that's our, our mission field. What he's saying is if there's a brother or sister in the Lord who's in continual sin, refuses to repent and get right with God, you need to confront them, talk with them in love. If they don't listen to you, bring another uh, brother or sister to that per with that person, talk with them. And if they don't, you bring it before the elders, and then the person's removed from the church. You think, oh, that's horrible. It's more horrible if they continue on in that sin. Why do you want to remove them from the church? Because 
as Paul said, let Satan buffet them for a while. They're not in the protection of the body of Christ. And maybe they'll come to their senses, repent and get right with God and return. And then you welcome them back. That's a tough one for a lot of people. But I think that's important because if you really love them, you want to see them change. Now, the second point that John is making regarding God being light and what it does in our life is found in verse 7 of 1 John 1. It says, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. So if we as Christians walk in the light, walk where God is, if we're obedient to him, we not only have fellowship with God, but we have fellowship with, other, with others, our brothers and sisters in the Lord. That will never happen if your relationship with God is off. It's only when our relationship with God is in line that our relationships with our brothers and sisters in the Lord will be in line also. And if you look at the Ten Commandments, that's how they're laid out. The first four deal with our relationship with God. That's the most important. And the last six deal with our relationship with with our fellow man. We see the uniqueness of God in Exodus 23, you shall have no other gods before me. Need to have that in line. The worship of God, Exodus 20, verse 4 and 5a. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. The third one, the honor of God, Exodus 20, verse 7. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And the blessing of, blessing of God, Exodus 20, verse 8, and verse 11b. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and howled it. And if your relationship with God is off, if your vertical axis is off, then your horizontal axis with your fellow man is going to be off. It's when you put these in line. You're in line with God that your horizontal axis with your fellow man is in line. Now, does that mean every brother or sister in the Lord, you guys are going to just be praising together and worshiping God? No. It depends on the other person. But you don't get in the way of stopping that koinini or that fellowship. You bless them. You love them. You pray for them. And then it's kind of up to them but you get your relationship with God in line. And if you do, then we see our relationships in line. Protection of the family, Exodus 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God has given you. My wife used to tell our kids, you know, honor your father and mother that you may not die. I think that's a paraphrase, but I thought it was a good one. The, the sixth point Protection of human life, Exodus 20, verse 13, you shall not murder. Wow. Protection of marriage, you shall not commit adultery. Protection of private property, Exodus 20, 15, you shall not steal. Protection of truth and integrity, Exodus 20, verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And lastly, protection of individual rights, Exodus 20, verse 17. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. In other words, if you're walking in the light as he is in the light, your fellowship with God is going to be awesome, and your joy will be full, and your relationships with your brothers and sisters, with your fellow man, will be in line as well. But if we're not walking with God, then our relationship with God is broken. We lose that fullness of joy that only God can give us. And it's out of that that we see our fellowship with our fellow man way off. It's ugly. People are bitter and they're just, you know, angry and they get, it's horrible. But it's hard to let those things go when you're not walking with God. Because I guarantee you, when you're walking with God, he shows you what you need to change. Or a brother or sister will come along and say, hey, you know, what's going on? Iron sharpens iron. We need that. And the solution, when we're struggling with all these things, and John's going to speak of it more as we read on here in a minute, but he said in verse 7 of John chapter, 1 John chapter 1, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And it's the Greek 
speaks of a continual cleansing. And we need that. Why? Because we sin. And John's not speaking of our salvation here, but again, of our fellowship. The blood of Christ has cleansed us from all our sins in a positional sense. But in a practical sense, our sins can hinder our relationship with God, absolutely. And what happens is the more we ignore sin, the more we become accustomed to it. And instead of walking in the light where God is, we're walking in the darkness and we don't have the fellowship with God as we once did. And it's kind of interesting. There was a, a movie out oh, several years ago. Gavin McLeod, I think, was in it. Uh, it was called, I think, Time Changer, I believe. And uh, it was interesting because uh, these Christian guys, one of them got to go into the future and see all the changes that took place because they started compromising their faith. And down the road, it was amplified. So many years down the road, here's this guy from the past living now in the future, and he goes into a movie theater, and the name of God is used in vain. And he's outraged. Nobody else is. Why? Because they became accustomed to it. I guarantee you, if we were able to go back to, say, the 1960s or 70s, what we saw on TV back then is so different than what we see today. Some of these commercials, you know, I'm sitting eating dinner, and here comes this commercial. I'm like, oh, my gosh. This, this would never play out in 1960, 1970. Never. But now it is, and we get accustomed to it, and they keep pushing it more and more and more, and we get accustomed to it. And down the road, we don't realize how far we've gone. How do we get back? The Word of God. That's what gets us back in line. And yet, you know, God is so gracious and patient with us, and he's constantly working in our lives, and he's trying to help us to grow because he loves us. Never think of God as angry or bitter or just ready to smash us. He's a loving father, and he cares for us. And as we read on, we're going to see what we might call these next three verses, confusion, solution, and delusion. And we'll see that as we read on. Look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. So here's the confusion we think we don't sin any longer. And again, John's coming against false teachers and teachings of Gnosticism. And again, they believe the body is evil. The spirit is good. And they believe they weren't sinning because the body is just evil and it doesn't really matter. So you could do whatever you want it. And that's really not sin because the body is the flesh and the spirit is good. So do whatever you want. No concern. And when you reject the truth, it's amazing what you'll believe. And, I, you know, people say things today about their sin. You know, I'm not perfect. I'm only human. I got my temper from my parents. You know I'm Italian, so you know how that works. No, those are excuses. God doesn't want you to justify your sin. What does he want you to do? He wants you to repent, to re agree with him regarding it. And John says, you know, if you think you're sinless, if you think you're perfect, Hey, the truth isn't in you. You know, we are born with a sin nature. We're in rebellion against God, and we could commit sin every day. I mean, think about it. Little kids. You got a couple of little kids playing together, right? And one takes something from another. And they're not giving it back. Mine, right? Did you teach them that? Oh, no, that's the sin nature in them. That's why the Bible says you have to train up a child because we're all born with that sin nature and it's manifested. And the problem a lot of times today is we don't deal with that because our kids are perfect. Everyone gets a trophy. Everybody wins. My kid is perfect. It's their fault, his fault, whatever. Hey, look, when I got in trouble in school, I not only got in trouble in school, 
I got in trouble when I came home. And I knew I did wrong. And I turned out okay, right? Right? I think I did. No, you, you got to know when you do wrong. That's really, really important. Because if you don't understand that, where does it end then? We think about this. How many people today want to tell us, oh, we're all good. We're, we're all good people, basically, right? The mental health professionals tell us that we're not responsible for our bad behavior uh, because it's a result of external factors because we were born, you know, mentally healthy, healthy without sin. You know, they wouldn't use the word sin, but mentally healthy. And thus, we've, something's happened in our lives to mess, up, mess us up. Hey, you know, if that were true, every single person on this planet would be messed up. And I think that's what they want because it's called job security. And I'll be honest with you, we all come from a dysfunctional family. That's really true. I mean, did you ever look at Adam and Eve? That's a pretty dysfunctional family. So we all come from one. But we've been adopted into a new family, the family of God. So those things have passed. All things have become new. Don't focus on the past. Focus on where you're at now. But again, the idea here is it's not my fault. Well, if you do something that's wrong, it is your fault. T.A. McMahon put it like this, and he kind of nails it for us because this is flooded into the church, and, you know, it it hasn't helped. Psychological counseling often promotes promotes the belief that problems adversely affecting a person's mental and emotional welfare are determined by circumstances external to the person, such as parental abuse or environment. I'm not saying that never happens. It does happen to a lot of people. But that's not justification for your behavior. The Bible tells us that a man's evil heart and his sinful choices cause his mental, emotional, and behavioral uh, problems. For from, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, theft, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile The man. That's what the Bible says. So is God wrong? Well, you know, back then they didn't have psychiatry, so, you know, he didn't know. He's God. He knows everything. So I'm not real worried about that. I think God knows what he's saying. He goes on to say, psychotherapy attempts to improve the self through concepts such as self-love, self-esteem, self-worth, and uh, self-image, self-actualization, etc., what does the Bible t- say about self? What does Jesus say? You've got to crucify the flesh, right? Deny yourself. Take up the cross. It's in opposition to what the world is telling us. He goes on, the Bible teaches that self is humanity's main problem, not the solution to the ills that plague mankind. And it prophetically identifies the chief solution of psychological counseling, self-love, as the catalyst to a life of depravity. 2 Timothy 3.1, this know also that in the last days perilous time shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Exactly. So we have all this confusion, right? And there's a solution. And for 1995, I can tell you, no, this is free because it's from God. What's the solution? Look at verse 9 here in 1 John 1. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. Before we can receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have to confess before him that we're sinners. That's our nature. Ask him to cleanse us from our sins, to be Lord and Savior of our life, to give us this new nature in Christ. And when we do at that moment, all of our sins are forgiven. We're justified. Our sins are cast as far as the east is from the west to be remembered no more. That's where we are positionally speaking. Cleansed as white as snow, our salvation is secure in him because he's paid in full the penalty for our sins. The work's finished, salvation-wise. But I don't think John is speaking of the unsaved here. I believe he's speaking of those who are saved and are confused about things and they need to remember the solution. 
Once we come to Christ, we need to have that cleansing in our life. Not for salvation again, but for fellowship. And sin breaks that fellowship. Proverbs 28, verses 13 and 14. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. Wow. You know, you look at the kings of Judah and Israel, and you can see what happens as they harden their hearts to God. They ignored their sin, and they moved farther and farther away from God. Why? Why did they move away from God? Because light exposes their darkness, and for them to continue in their sin, to ignore their sin, they needed to walk in darkness. Look at the revivals that took place in the Old Testament. How did they happen? What took place? They found the Word of God, didn't they? They began to read it, and conviction, they were cut to the heart, and they repented of their sins. Wow. Absolutely. That's what we need to do. God is gracious. He is merciful. And if we confess our sin before him, he's going to forgive. That fellowship won't be hindered. I like the way William MacDonald put it. He said, the forgiveness John speaks about here is parental, not judicial. Judicial forgiveness means forgiveness from the penalty of sins, which the sinner receives when he believes on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is called judicial because it is granted by God acting as judge. But what about sins which a person commits after conversion? As far as the penalty is concerned, the price has already been paid by the Lord Jesus on the cross of Calvary. But as far as fellowship in the family of God is concerned, the sinning saint needs parental forgiveness, that is, the forgiveness of his father. He obtains it by confessing his sin. We need judicial forgiveness only once. That takes care of the penalty of all our sins, past, present, and future. But we need parental forgiveness throughout our Christian life. Absolutely. And the Greek word that uh, John uses for confess here speaks of saying the same thing or we're in agreement with God regarding sin. We hate sin and not just hate it, but we want to avoid it, forsaking it. But if we don't agree with God, we don't forsake sin, we can break, again, fellowship with God because of it. So you confess or agree with God regarding sin, you forsake it to restore that. And, you know, This is our sanctification process, you might say, where God is molding and shaping us to be more like him. So we've seen confusion, and then the solution, and then the delusion. In verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. There's only one person who's ever lived that had never sinned in his entire life, and that was Jesus, period. Paul tells us, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So yeah, the old man was crucified with Christ. Don't live in the past. Live in the present with Christ. And yeah, the flesh tries to resurrect itself. Paul talked about it. You know, walk in the spirit. You won't fulfill the lust of the flesh because the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. There's a battle going on in our lives. And I'm doing really good when I'm sleeping. It's when I wake up that I always get into trouble. And Lord, help me, right? As soon as I wake up, Lord, here we go another day. Help me because there's this battle that's going on. In fact, I like what one person said. No man was ever kept out of God's kingdom for his confessed badness. Many are for their supposed goodness. Yeah, how true that is. You know, we got to run this race. You know, fight the good fight. Discipline our bodies. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So positionally, we're saved, cleansed from all our sins. Practically, We still sin. We confess our sins before God to restore that fellowship, to make us aware of these things that are wrong so we don't get used to them, so we don't just keep doing them. And God is faithful, guys, and he wants us to walk in the light, to dwell in his presence, to be where he is at and enjoy fellowship with him. 
And as John said, one of the reasons he wrote this, verse 4, these things we write to you so that your joy may be full. I mean, I don't know about you, but in the days we're living in, I want my joy to be full. I don't want to be overwhelmed with all the garbage that's out there. It's not that I don't want to be aware of what's going on. It's not that I don't want to be sensitive to the needs of others that are really hurting out there. But I want to keep my eyes on Jesus and say, Lord, how do you want to use me? Because there is a world of hurt out there. There's a world out there that is so hopeless because they're looking at what's going on. Do you really think that those stimulus checks are going to keep coming? Because if they do, we will be bankrupt. There will not be, we won't have any money left. It's not that you can just print it because then there's no value to it. You can print a million dollars. It could be worth 10 cents. So we put our hope in the government. We put our hope in this job. We put our hope in this. We put our hope in that. And God says, put your hope in me. Rest in me. And man, your joy is going to be full and people will want what you have. Walk in the light as he is in the light. Let's pray. Well, Father, we thank you for your wonderful words here in John. Lord, just encouraging, knowing that you are almighty God, you came to save us. Almighty God became flesh, dwelt among us, tabernacled among us. Fully God, fully man in the incarnation. Paid for our sins. There's no darkness in God at all. There's only light, pure light, not even a speck. And now we are to walk in that light. Have fellowship with God. Have fellowship with each other. Deal with the sins in our life so we don't get used to them. Keep that fellowship open and keep us shining for you, Lord. May our joy be full in you. Thank you, Lord, for your word this evening. And Lord, guide us each day as we keep our eyes on you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.